planned. Happy New Year! It's hard to believe we're in 2020. Who would have thought we'd be here? You know, when I was on my wife's parents for the holidays, they were talking way back when 1999 became 2000. And what was the scare? Do you remember the scare? Y2K. Here we are in 2020. Unbelievable. Well, we're one year closer to Jesus is coming. That's one thing for sure. And I just want to wish everyone here happy Sabbath. As Lori and I were traveling out to Owego, New York, to spend time with her parents this holiday season, we got to see some wildlife. One such animal we spotted on our long journey, maybe about an hour away from her parents' home, was one of the great birds, the bald eagle. In fact, what we spotted was two bald eagles. So I did a little research on bald eagles. I discovered that one of their primary food sources is eating fish. I also learned that they are capable of living up to 40 years in the wild. Furthermore, they are monogamous and remain faithful to their mate until death. But one of the most amazing things that these birds are especially renowned for is their excellent eyesight. Eagles have two foveae, or centers of focus, in the retina of each eye that allows them to see both forward and to the side at the same time. Our retinas, as humans, have only one foveae. Depending on which way the eagle looks, the lens of its eye focuses an image on one foveae or the other. The rear foveae is for seeing forward, and the other is for looking sideways. Both foveae are more densely lined with rods and cones than those of human eyes, giving them much greater resolving power. They also have eyelids that close only during sleep. For blinking, though, they have an inner eyelid called a nictating membrane. Every three to four seconds, the nictating membrane slides across the eye from front to back, wiping dirt and dust from the cornea. Because the membrane is translucent, the eagle can see even while the membrane covers the eye. So they have constant sight. Eagles have color vision as well. And even though their eyes are smaller than our eyes, their sharpness is at least four times that of a person with perfect vision. While soaring, gliding, or flapping, they are capable of seeing fish in the water from several hundred feet above, or identify a rabbit moving almost a mile away. An eagle flying in a fixed position at an altitude of 1,000 feet could spot prey as small as a mouse over an area of almost three square miles. Eagles are pretty incredible, wouldn't you say? You know, the Bible teaches that a Christian, like you and me, must be able to maintain spiritual vision with their eyes on heaven while still living in the dark world below. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision the people perish. Without the bald eagle's ability to see as they do, they would more likely not be able to survive. So how important is vision? Better yet, how important is it to have the right vision? We see how important it is for an eagle to have the right kind of vision. So how about you and I? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need you. We need you more than we realize. 2020 has just begun, and we don't know what is ahead of us. Lord, we don't know if we'll make it through this year, or if we do, what type of state we'll be in. You see all, and so Lord, we're looking to you for help, for grace, and for strength to have the right vision for 2020. So Lord, as I am here before your people to speak, I realize my words can't do anything. Your word is the only thing that can do the impossible. 
which is change a sinner's heart, of which what we need, Lord. We all need it. So speak to us this morning. Hide me behind the cross. And if there be any sin in me, Lord, I pray now that you'll cleanse me of it, that the message that you have will not be unhindered. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are after Christmas and New Year's. Where's the focus of the world and of society? What is important to the peoples of this world? Our society has just come off of Christmas with buying this and buying that. As a result, many are consumed with getting things. For some, it is the accumulation of money so they can have security for the future. With others, it is pleasure-seeking with doing this or seeing that. And then there is politics. A great portion of people's attention has been wrapped up into the mess of political corruption that is going on. I think it would be hard to find someone who is not. And don't get me wrong, this is of vast importance, especially as it relates to Bible prophecy and our freedoms. But could it be that for many who are so wrapped up with the news cycles that they are losing love for one another, especially for those who are on the other side of the aisle? Let's not forget the impact on one's personal health regarding the stress and anxiety that comes with such a constant tracking of the political issues. So let me ask you, what is it that has consumed your thoughts this past year in 2019? What is consuming your thoughts and focus for life now? What is more important to you? These are all, question, these are all important questions. We are four days into the new year of 2020. What are your goals, your interests? Where are you planning to put your energy and money into this year? What we will decide will either bring us closer to Jesus or further away from him. There are basic essentials that we would see as very important to us, such as our family members and friends, the food we eat, the water we drink, the clothes that we wear, the money we have in our bank accounts, and most of all, the very life that we have. Would you say these are also the things that we worry about much? It's true when you, th when you and I think about it. We are creatures of worry. As a result, we busy ourselves seeking ways to secure these things. Interestingly, these are the things that God assures us that he will take care of. He makes this clear to us in the book of Matthew. If you have your Bibles with me, I'd like to have you pull your Bible out. Turn to the New Testament. First book of the New Testament, Matthew. We're looking at Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. We're going to find ourselves smack dab in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount here. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your what? Life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Stop there. God asks us a question. So why do you worry? So why is it that we worry? It's a good question. I believe it is because our focus is off, that we have a lack of perfect vision on what really matters in life. Jesus said, is not life more than food? Is not life more than clothing? We could add to this, is not life more than the following of the news cycles after news cycles? Isn't life more than how much money you have? Or how much money you have by retirement? Or how to secure this thing or possess that thing? Isn't life more than these things? This is a good question to ponder. What does Jesus say to us in this season of your life? Let's read it here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew 6.30 says, 
Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is, thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Translation. If God takes care of the little birdies and eagles, will he not surely take care of you and all that worries you? And because he will take care of these things that concern our life, what does he tell us in 2020 that should be our focus and the most important to you and me? Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first. What? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, the things that he talked about, food, clothing, whatever else you can add there, shall be added to you. Isn't that good news, friends? God says, I'll take care of what is important for your livelihood. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what is it that should be the most important focus of my life and your life? What will give us perfect vision for 2020? The Bible says, seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness is a constant fight in our world and in our flesh. We are geared to focus on the temporal things that concern our life instead of the true meaning and purposes in life, which is God and his kingdom. Now, I thank the Lord for my wife, Lori. She's a jewel to me and my, and, and my kids. Her patience with Lily and Nathaniel and her care for them is unparalleled to mine. And she is full of neat ideas. One such idea just recently that she came up with in collaboration with her mother was how do you provide a way to point the kids to the true meaning of the season and not get lost in the accumulation of toys? You know how it is for those who have kids. They purchased something called Shepherd on the Search. It started on the last day of November, on November 30th. Lori put one gift out for the kids to open up. When they discovered that gift and they opened it up, they found inside a shepherd in a neat little book about the shepherd's search of the one important gift, Jesus Christ, our Messiah. The story later went on to describe how the shepherd was going to help them to not miss that one true an important gift to them. How was it going to happen? The shepherd would be hidden each day until Christmas, and they would have to seek the shepherd out. Once they found him, he would have a Bible passage with him that would lead them to doing acts of kindness or learn spiritual lessons to engage them to connect with the Christ of Christmas. I thought it was ingenious. How did this complete, now, did this completely take away their attention from toys and such? Not entirely, but it did do something to impact Lily and Nathaniel's life in seeking for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, we adults are just like my kids. It's just our focus is diverted by bigger toys and things that we seek after. And you know, we need similar help to not lose the true focus of life. We all need someone like that shepherd to help us to seek that which really matters. Speaking about searching, let's examine three parables that Jesus gives in his word that will help us to have our vision in the right direction. Our scripture reading was in Matthew, you remember? 13. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 13, shouldn't be far from there. Matthew 13, verse 44 and 46. In Matthew 13, verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And some of you are very familiar with these parables. Pretty interesting, you know, you find this parable here, and you, in our modern day, who finds a treasure in a field? But this was common back in Jesus' day. They didn't have bank accounts and banks like we do today. So if he had something that was very important and precious, you would have to try to find ways to secure it and keep it out of the hands of those you don't want to have it. So you would go and bury it in some secure place in the field. Well, what would happen is sometimes that person who put their treasure in the field, maybe they would die or something bad would happen to them or they'd lose their land. 
and the land would just go to plants growing and weeds and all that. And then before long, somebody else would be maybe walking across the field and maybe dig around and find there's a treasure. But it's not his field. So he has to quickly find another place to bury it and find means to get that field. Now, his family may look at him and be like, what in the world is my brother doing trying to buy that desolate field? What is the value of that? Why is he going to liquidate all his life savings to buy that field? What they don't know is that there's a hidden treasure in that field. And so, as the parable says, he liquidates all that he has and buys that field to gain that treasure. So let me ask you a question who is the person in the field? What's Jesus' point here? Yeah, I heard somebody say us. You'll be right. It is us. Who is the merchant man? It's us. So who would be the treasure and who would be the pearl? Come on, guys. It would be Jesus, right? It would be God. I've been reading through uh, my Bible, and uh, one of the things I've been reading is through the Conflict of the Age series. I don't know if you guys heard that terminology, but that usually um, is what is said to cover the five books that Ellen White wrote that covers basically the commentary of the Bible, which is Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, Great Controversy. Have you guys familiar with those books? What I've added to that reading is Christ's Object Lessons, Steps to Christ, Mount of Blessings. And one of the books I'm reading through right now is Christ's Object Lessons. If you have never read that book, I would encourage you to do it. Powerful. Goes through his parables and pulls them apart. In that book, Christ's Object Lessons, is found this quote. It's found in page 115. And it says this, The blessings of redeeming love our Savior compared to a precious pearl. He illustrated his lesson by the parable of the merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Notice what it says here. Christ himself is the pearl of great price. In him is gathered all the glory of the Father, the fullness of the Godhead. He is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. The glory of the attributes of God is expressed in his character. Every page of the Holy Scriptures shines with his light. I like to say that this pearl, this treasure, is not just Jesus. It's the Bible that you hold in your hands. Is the Bible precious to you? He is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. The glory of the attributes of God is expressed in his character. Every page of, whole, of the Holy Scripture shines with his light. All that can satisfy the needs and longings of the human soul, don't miss this, for this world and for the world to come is the next iPhone. It is my nest egg that I got in my bank account. Is that person that I'm going to marry. What, does it say that? Let's read that again. All that can satisfy the needs and longings of the human soul for this world and for the world to come is found in Christ. Do you believe that? Our Redeemer is the pearl so precious that in comparison all things else may be accounted loss. Wow. Wow. Question, is he precious to you? In the parable, we are to seek for this pearl, but how are we to do this? Notice again what it says in Christ's Object Lessons. It says this in page 117, The gospel of Christ is a blessing that all may possess. Aren't you happy that all can possess this precious gift? Notice she makes it very clear here. The poorest are as well able as the richest to purchase salvation. For no amount of worldly wealth can secure it. It is obtained by willing obedience, by giving ourselves to Christ as his own purchased possession. 
education, even of the highest class, cannot of itself bring a man near to God. Now, we may think that at times. You look at me up here, Pastor Rob, or somebody like, man, they must be close to God because they're uneducated or they're in the Bible. The truth of the matter is, it's not the case. A lot of people at times are like the Pharisees, they're arrogant. But education does have its purpose, don't get me wrong here. But notice what she says here. Education, even of the highest class, cannot of itself bring a man near to God. We cannot earn salvation but we are to seek for it with as much interest and perseverance as though we would abandon everything in the world for it. There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire what? Of their wrong habits, they do not what? Die to self, that Christ may live in them. Therefore, they do not find the precious pearl. They have not overcome unholy ambition and their love for worldly attractions. They do not take up the cross and follow Christ in the path of self-denial and sacrifice. So what does it cost to obtain this pearl, this treasure? Surrender. Submission to God entirely. Now, the third parable we will look at soon. But let me ask you a question. Who is really... Seeking who? You might be asking, wait a second, you just spent this time talking about us seeking for the treasure, us seeking for the pearl. Of course, it's us seeking him, seeking God, seeking a relationship with him. But bear with me. Is it you seeking God? Or is it God seeking you? In Psalms 139, it says this. O Lord, what? You have what? Searched me and known me. Who has searched us? The Lord. Another one. You're familiar with this one. Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to what? Seek and save that which was lost. Now don't miss this. We are able to seek him because he has made himself known by seeking us. In fact, if God was not out in the open seeking after us, we would never be able to find him. Reminds me of Genesis chapter 3. What were Adam and Eve doing? Are they seeking God? Or was God seeking them? So let's go back to Matthew 13, and let's re-look at those two parables, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. Matthew 13, it says again, verse 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Let me ask you again, who is the pearl? Who is the treasure? I heard somebody say Jesus Christ. God. You would be right. Everybody who said that would be right. But let me read to you this other statement from Christ's Object Lessons. Page 118. The parable of the merchant man seeking goodly pearls has a what? Double significance. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven, but to who? Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. Christ, the heavenly merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, saw in who? Lost humanity, the pearl of price. You know who that pearl is? It's you, it's me. Merchant man is Christ. She goes on to say this. In man, defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption. Hearts that have been the battleground of the conflict with Satan and that have been rescued by the power of love are more precious to the Redeemer than are those who have never fallen. Wow. How precious are you to God right now? And you are of immense value. You are of 
infinite value. God looked upon humanity not as vile and worthless. He looked upon it in Christ, saw it as it might become through redeeming love. He collected, notice what happens here. He collected all, how much did he collect? All the riches of the universe and laid them down in order to buy the pearl. And Jesus, having found it, resets it in his own diadem. For they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, and that day when I make up my jewels. That is something incredible. I have another passage for you, Psalms 23, verse 6. See what the Bible says about this. Surely what? Goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me all the days of my life. You know, when I think about goodness and mercy, I think of that rich young ruler who came up to Jesus and said, Good master, what must we do to be saved? And he says, what did he say to the rich young ruler? There is was, there was no one good but what? God alone. I'm also reminded of Moses wanting to see God because God's seen him and doing all these wonderful things. And God says, you can't see me, Moses, and live. But I'll tell you what, I'll hide you in a cleft of a rock. You can see me as I pass by. And as that happens, there is this proclamation of who God is. And one of those things that's said about God is he's merciful. He's merciful. So when I think about that, who is goodness? God. The goodness of God draws us to repentance. Who is merciful? God. So who is following you all the days of your life? God. You know, this passage is not just about the believer. This is about the unbeliever as well. God is pursuing everybody in this sinful world. And he's doing it until they draw their last breath. You can't get away from God. Now here's the third parable. It is found in Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. Now I don't have it on the screen, so you're going to have to go in your Bible to Luke chapter 15. So Luke chapter 15, and we're looking at the parable of the lost sheep. Luke 15 Looking at verse 4 to 6. In Luke 15, chapter uh, 15, verse 4, it says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Are you seeking him? Notice this other statement from Christ's object lessons. I'm sorry about all these statements, but I can't say it better than this. But in Christ's object lessons, page 187, it says, As the shepherd loves his sheep and cannot rest if even one be missing. How many? Have you ever had some dollar bills or maybe a a penny? (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's just a penny. Who cares? Oh, it's just one sheep. I got 99 of them. What is it? What's the use? Tells you how important the one is to God. As a shepherd loves his sheep and cannot rest if even one be missing, so in an infinitely higher degree does God love every outcast soul. Men may deny the claim of his love. They may wander from him. They may choose another master. Yet, they are gods, and he longs to recover his own. He says, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep, and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. It reminds me of that passage in Romans, 
Where sin abounded, grace much more abounds. There is no sin, bad habit, or addiction you find yourself in that God cannot save you from. That's good news. In the parable, the shepherd goes out to search for one sheep, the very least that can be numbered. So if there had been but one lost soul, Christ would have died for that one. The sheep that has strayed from the fold is the most helpless of all creatures. It must be sought for by the shepherd, for it cannot find its way back. So with the soul that has wandered away from God, he is as helpless as the lost sheep. And unless divine love had come to his rescue, he could never find his way to God. The shepherd who discovers that one of his sheep is missing does not look carelessly upon the flock that is safely housed and say, I have 99, and it will cost me too much trouble to go in search of that strained one. Let him come back, and I will open the door of the sheepfold if he happens to make it back. Is that what he says? You know what she says? One sentence. No, God does not think indifferently about you. And then it says this, No sooner does the sheep go astray than the shepherd is filled with what? Grief and anxiety. For those parents out there who are suffering from children who are not walking with the Lord and you have that grief and anxiety, God fuels your grief and anxiety. In fact, he suffers more than you do. He counts and recounts the flock. When he is sure that one sheep is lost, he slumbers not. He leaves the 99 within the fold and goes in search of the straying sheep. The darker and more tempestuous the night and the more perilous the way, the greater is the shepherd's anxiety and the more earnest his search. He makes how much effort? Every effort to find that one lost sheep. God will empty all of heaven to make sure you're in the kingdom. In the parable, does the shepherd fail in finding his lost sheep? Can you read the parable here? Does it have any indication that he fails in this? No. You see it right there. He finds it. When he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and brings it back and rejoices. Notice again what it says here in Christ's Object Lessons 188. Thank God he has presented to our imagination no picture of a sorrowful shepherd returning without the sheep. The parable does not speak of failure, but of success and joy in the recovery. Here is a divine guarantee that not even one of the strange sheep of God's fold is overlooked. Not one is left unsuckered. Every one that will submit to be ransomed. There's our part there, by the way. He's seeking you. But our part is to what? Submit to be ransomed. And notice what it says. Christ will what? Rescue from the pit of corruption and from the briars of sin. Desponding soul. Then she appeals here. Desponding soul. You feel you're desponding. Take courage, even though you have done wickedly, God has made what? The first advance. I just love that. While you were in rebellion against him, when did he make the first advance? When we were doing good and coming back to him? When we were rebelling against him, he made the first advance towards us. You want to know what God thinks of you? He thinks immensely affectionate things about you. He loves you. goes on to say, he went forth to seek you. In the parable of the lost sheep, Christ teaches that salvation does not come through our seeking after God, but through God's seeking after what? Us. Good news. You know the Bible passage? We love him because he first loved us. Well, this, I believe, is also true about seeking him. You can only seek him because he is seeking you. So you may ask the question, and we spent part of this message talking about us seeking God, 
giving, not, not let anything get in the way of seeking him and obtaining him. And then we spent the other half about him seeking us. So why is it, when we look at these statements, clear statements here, of his earnest effort of seeking us, that I need to seek him if he's seeking me? I believe it's simple. If you are not turning in his direction to seek him, then there's only one other option, and that is that you must be running from him as he is pursuing you. If you're not seeking him, you've got to realize here that God is running after you. He's trying to get to you. But if you keep running from him and dodging him, like, ah, you can't get me. He's a gentleman, and he's not going to get you against your will, but he will be on your track. And so God's like, seek me. Turn around and face me. I'm not after you to kill you or destroy you. I'm after you to save you. What is it that's distracting you in 2020 already? Is it worth letting that thing distract you? It won't satisfy your soul. All that is going to satisfy your life in this world and the world to come is found in who? Christ. Is Bible study important to you? Is seeking souls to win to the kingdom important to you? Is family worship important to you? Again, why is it that we are to seek him when he's seeking us? Because if we're not seeking him, we're running from him. By you seeking him with all your heart and all your energy, it will be to the degree that you allow him to overtake you into his embrace. Don't worry, God won't get tired. How long will he be following you? All the days of your life. You can be running from him. You can be cursing at him. He'll keep on following you. Don't worry. You can keep hitting me and all that. I'm going to keep following you. So you see, God is a gentleman. He will not overtake you against your will. Your seeking after him gives God permission to overtake you. Will you let him? Notice how involved all of heaven is in searching you and I out that we may become heirs of salvation. Here's another one. This is from Christ Object Lessons, page 176. His pleasure is more in his people struggling with temptation in a world of sin than in the host of angels that surround his throne. Where is God's pleasure at? It's in you. More than the heavenly angels that surround his throne. Then it goes on to say this. Remember, we're asking the question, how much of heaven is involved in this searching? In this speck of the world, the whole heavenly universe manifests the greatest interest. Wow, if you're an angel up in heaven, what would you be focused on? With our carnal hearts, I think we might be focused on the golden streets and the amazing amazing city and the special abilities I have. And Why would I be focused on this little planet that's in red against God? That's not the case. The, the whole heavenly universe manifests the greatest interest in this speck of the universe. Where's your interest? For Christ has paid an infinite price for the souls of its inhabitants. The world's redeemer has bound earth to heaven by ties of intelligence for the redeemed of the Lord are here. What's this saying? God is so, so, so very interested in us. As we conclude, let's consider how we can allow God to overtake us in this 2020 year. Here's the thing. God is pursuing every single one of you, whether you believe or not. You know, that opening him, more of Jesus. We need more of Jesus, my friends. We're still here. Have, are we going to let God overtake us more in our life than he did in 2019? So how will we allow him to do that? Here are three practical imperatives for you and your family to pursue. Number one, daily Bible reading and prayer. 
daily Bible reading and prayer, don't let anything get in between your time with God on a daily basis. And then seeking his face in prayer. Do you remember that statement in Christ Object Lessons about Christ being the pearl? Remember that? How we read about that earlier? Christ himself is the pearl of great price, and it later goes on to say, every page of the Holy Scriptures shines with his light. How important should this be for us in 2020? Should be the greatest importance for us. Number two, daily worship with the members of your family, even if that is just between you and your spouse. Very important. You know, you may have a marriage that's struggling right now. I can tell you one thing that will help it out if you're not doing it is family worship. There's nothing better than drawing close to Jesus in the storms of life, especially together as a family. Our kids and our spouses need it. We need it more than ever. You look at society out there, it's not friendly. We need that family worship. Number three, look for ways to share Jesus with the unbelievers and or those who are struggling in their faith in your life through giving Bible studies. Look for ways to witness and share your faith. Another thing is getting involved in, in a ministry in this church or in a church office. Because it is an active service for God and to others in your life that you will grow in your devotion to seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness. These are the things I believe are very important practically in seeking God in 2020. We got some amazing things. We're going to be having a planning session happening, I believe, on January 19th. We want to plan as a church what we can do here in Battle Creek. We would love for you to be a part of that. We have 10 days of prayer starting next week. I believe it's on the 8th and it goes to the 18th. If you are wanting to have a closer walk with God, come on out. We're going to be here at the church. I believe it's at 7 o'clock at night. We'll give you more details. And be part of that. We got a prayer meeting we're going to try to revitalize and bring back in January, end of January. Come out to that. These are ways of seeking God in 2020. And there's more. There's more. I want to close with this passage of Scripture from Deuteronomy 30. In Deuteronomy 30, Moses is giving his last commission, if you will, to the people of Israel. And they are just on the brink of the borders of Canaan. And Moses knows he's about ready to die. And these are some of the last words that he shares with them. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. I believe Moses is communicating something to the Israelites. That God is not somebody who's far off. It's not about you seeking him. It is important. You need to seek him. But it's about him seeking you. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. You know, this makes me think of this, the reason of the season, Christmas and all that. It's all about God coming down from heaven in human form to seek us out. In fact, I believe the Christmas story, the Advent story of Christ coming to the earth, is a very, very microscopic picture of our human humanity. While God is seeking us out, where are the people? Where is the Pharisees and religious leaders when the greatest event is going to take place there 2,000 years ago? Are they there at the manger? Are they there providing the best place for Mary to give birth? Where is the people? They're not there. In fact, the shepherds are only made aware because the angels come down and sing that heavenly song about the greatest gift that's taking place. Even if the angels weren't there, those shepherds probably wouldn't have been there at the birth of Jesus. God is seeking us. Moses continues to say, Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? 
But how close in proximity is God to us? Here's what, he, here's what Moses says. But the word is very near you, in your mouth, and in your heart that you may do it. How close is God to you and me? He's right here. He's right here. And then he closes with this. I see, see, I have set before you today life and good. You want life for 2020? You want good for, in your life? Pursue God. The opposite is death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may, I love this part here, that you may cling to him. For he is your life in the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Friends, Heaven, we're on the knife edge of eternity right now. Heavenly Canaan is at our doorstep. Where's your focus for 2020? Hastening the coming of Jesus? I hope it is. To cling to him? So as we end... I want to ask this question. So what will your choices be this year? Is it your desire to have God overtake you in his arms of love? He's pursuing you. Is that your desire, to have God overtake you in his love? To let him consume your thoughts and your directions of life? If that is you, will you raise your hand with me and say, God, count me in. I want to be the one that allows you to be my focus in my life in 2020. I want you front and center in my life. And you may struggle with that, but you know what? God's going to help you. The same about you making promises. God doesn't need your promises. What he needs is he just needs your choice. And if you have to make that choice repeatedly throughout the year, so be it. But as long as you're making a choice in his direction, he's going to help you get through this year better off than you were in 2019. But it's going to take you making a choice. Each day you wake up, and today is a day to make a choice. And God's Holy Sabbath. Lord, I want you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you to overtake me. You say, count me in, Lord. Count me in. Well, let us pray. As we ask for God for help. And Joyce, you can come up, get ready to, um, to uh, get positioned up here. But we're going to pray and ask God for his help. Heavenly Father, Here we are four days into the new year, 2020. There's many things, many things that Satan has prepared for us in this year to distract us, get our focus off, Lord, to not have the right vision and to chase after other visions that he wants us to have. But you have a better vision for us, a vision, Lord, that moth nor rust nor corrosion can take away from us. And that vision, Lord, is what we don't see right now. For what we do see, Lord, will pass away, but what we don't see will always be. And that is prepared for us right now in heaven, Lord. I believe that you gave me this message, Lord, because this is a burden of my heart, Lord. I need you more in my life. I need you, Lord, to be my focus as a husband to my wife, as a Bible worker seeking souls in Batter Creek, as a parent to my children. I need you, Lord, and I know that if I need you, Lord, others in this congregation need you, Lord, more. So, Lord, overtake us, Lord. If it's something that we're struggling with, if we're struggling with time with you and your word, Lord, oh, help us to prioritize it, Lord. Help us to choose you, to spend time in your word each day, to pray and seek your face. Lord, help us. If we have family, if we have a spouse, Lord, to have family worship, Turn off the TV, Lord. Maybe for some of us, we may have to get rid of the TV because it's, it's, just, it, it's part of the, the distracting element, Lord. But help us, O oh Lord, to surround our family, our spouses, Lord, in worship of you. Help us to pray more together, Lord, in this year. As a church, 
as family members in our own little homes. I also pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to get more involved in your cause. It may not seem that it's as important as what's happening in the political world right now, but it is more important. You've told us, Lord, that this church will make it in, that this church will be the church to give the loud cry. That this church, Lord, will be used in such a powerful way. And and it's not just building, Lord, it's us. We'll be used in such a powerful way by your grace, you working in us, Lord, to bring this vast scene of misery to an end. And why can't it be brought closer to an end, Lord, in this year with seeing you come in the clouds of glory? It can, Lord. So help us, Lord, to seek after you as you are seeking after us. And we thank you, Lord, that you've made yourself visible, putting yourself out in the open that we can find you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.